master's degree program with uh, Dr. Anwar Islam. Is there anything essential about you, Bryce, besides you're eager to get going? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think we'll try to get on with this. Okay. We've wasted yeah. enough time. Oh, do you need a pointer? Oh, um, no. Okay. Um, so, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, thank you for your patience as we're dealing with these technical issues. Um, but today I'd like to take a little bit of time to tell you about an ongoing forage um, research project that I became a part of this last summer. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about a biofuel component that we've added to this project. Um, but before I really get into any of the details, um, this is kind of the more broad roadmap of the speech that I'm going to give today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information on the forage study. Um, I'm going to talk about why it's important, why we've been, um, undertaken this study, and I'm also going to talk about um, why we've added the biofuel component to it as well. Um, then I'm going to go into how we're actually conducting the experiment, how it was designed, how it was laid out and established, um, and then also what we're continuing to do and what we're going to do in the future. Um, and, and further analysis. Um, I'm also going to talk about where we're at right now. Um, some of the data that we've already collected, some of the stuff that we're looking at, um, and then also the stuff that we're going to look at. And then before you go home, I'm going to try to wrap it up for you in a nice little summary so you can go tell all your friends about how cool this is. <laughs> um, so the reason why we're doing this um, is grass is an important crop. Um, this wasn't necessarily a crop that jumped out at me initially. Um, you know, I'm kind of one of those guys. That, like I said, I'm from botany. So I work with different stuff. Um, I wasn't necessarily that excited about forage type stuff or cows. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of come around, um, especially looking at the more wider application of grass. Um, there's horticulture applications. This grows in your lawn. This grows in your parks. Um, your golf courses, your baseball fields. I don't know if I would say that baseball is a direct grass product, but I couldn't imagine playing baseball without grass. So the species that we're actually looking at um, is called tall fescue. It's gone through a couple of name changes through its history, um, but we're looking at it because it's a really, um, just, just a really good producing um, grass species. It's really tolerant of adverse conditions in terms of cold, um, water supply, um, it's just been really, it's been a good performer in the past. We've looked at it, um, and a lot of other people have looked at it. Um, it actually grows around the world. Uh, it's been used, <coughs> well, it was native to Eurasia, and since its introduction to the United States in 1940, um, it's been utilized across the nation. It's good for pastures, it's good for hay production. Um, like I said, it's commonly used in lawns. Um, <coughs> And it also has some reclamation type applications um, in terms of erosion control and some of these other things. Um, anything you can do with the grass, tall fescue is pretty good at it. Um, and this is some of the stuff, or this is where it actually grows. Um, this kind of shows just how variable <coughs> and adaptable this species is. Um, you can see it grows in Hawaii, it grows in Alaska, it grows in Texas. It grows all through Canada. Um, this is a really, really varied species. It does well in a lot of different conditions. Um, but some of the conditions it really excels at are some of these more marginal conditions. Um, some of the conditions we see here in Laramie. Uh, lower water, poor soil, high altitudes, cooler temperatures. Um, these, are ex these are really excellent conditions for um, tall fescue. It's a C3 grass. It's a temperate species. So these are all really great conditions um, for tall fescue to grow in. Um, some of the research that's backing up some of these traits, uh, just kind of putting it down on paper. Um, there have been studies that investigate this species because of its sustainability in a sod environment. Um, it performs sustainably in forage conditions. Um, and this is all because of the limited inputs that are required. Um, we're able to grow tall fescue with limited water limited nutrients, and also limited soil preparation. 
and uh, management. This all in in contributes to an overall high net profitability. Um, when you've got those lower input costs, you're going to be able to reap bigger benefits. Um, and this has been looked at a lot in uh, forage type studies. So we're going to look at it a little more, um, especially with the emphasis on this sort of climate. Um, mm -hmm. We're trying to utilize this diversity and variation and hardiness to identify lines that perform really well in these conditions. <coughs> Some of these um, climatic environments that we see in the Laramie environment. Um, <coughs> we want to measure traits that are economically important. Um, we want to measure things like total biomass, production time, um, quality. We want to find out all of this stuff and all under the low input uh, conditions that we're talking about. Um, in the future, this sort of information will be able to help develop new varieties of tall fescue, ones that are specialized for um, growing and producing high yields, high quality in these types of environments. Um, these are all traits that are contributing um, and leading us to believe that this could be a good biofuel species. Uh, so I'm going to kind of shift gears and talk about that a little bit right now. Um, the Department of Energy and the USDA have um, set a goal uh, by 2030, we're, we're hoping to reduce our dependence on foreign oil by 30% uh, through the use of biofuels. Um, currently, we're at about 3%. Um, there's a lot of room for growth, um, and the way that we're intending to go about that is by growing 1 billion tons, dry tons, of biofuel feedstocks per year. Um, this is a big task, and currently, the way that we're going about it is by using corn farming. Um, that's one of the really big contributors to biofuel, um, but it's also one of the biggest problems in terms of biofuel production. Um, net energy output for corn-based ethanol is not where we'd like to see it. Um, there's a lot of input requirements in terms of water, fertilizers, pesticides, um, and also soil preparations in terms of tillage and those sort of things. Um, this all limits the sustainability aspect of this, this source of biofuel. Um, not only in terms of just the input costs, but there are lots of greenhouse gas emissions um, created by the fertilizer production and also the tractors and things um, working the fields. Not only are we having those sort of sustainability problems, um, we also have a, an issue with um, Corn farming for ethanol takes up a lot of uh, fertile farmland that could be used for growing crops um, and food. This is um, going to continue to, this is going to be a growing problem as we rely more and more on biofuels for energy and also as um, food demands increase with growing world population. <coughs> so one of the ways to kind of counteract some of these negative and less sustainable practices is by utilizing plant species um, that are a little bit more efficient in terms of water use, uh, fertilizer use, um, management inputs. We really want to try to lower those costs. Um, there's a lot of different ways that have been pro proposed to reduce these costs. Um, and a lot of different crops are kind of looking to fill this gap. Um, algae, alfalfa, canola, Grapeseed, so, um, sorghum, sunflower, all kinds of different, there's all kinds of different crops. This is just a really small list. Um, these are some of the ones that have been kind of in the region a little bit. Um, but a lot of them don't necessarily perform the way that we'd like to. Um, switchgrass especially performs quite poorly in this environment. Um, alfalfa is a big, re big requirer of water. Um, these are all just things that kind of contribute to a lower net output. Um, again, very few of these crops are going to grow great in this environment. Um, some of you who maybe grow gardens during the summer are familiar with some of the problems we have um, in these climates. And so we're going to try to answer this, fill this gap with tall fescue. Don't you see? 
<laughs> Our preliminary data indicates that the tall fescue can be an excellent candidate for biofuel production analysis. Um, these are the same studies that I talked about in terms of forage context, but these are also um, really important traits in terms of biofuel producing crop. Um, low input costs, high yields, um, this is kind of what we're hoping to do, but there's been very little published research investigating tall fescue as a biofuel crop. Um, we intend to change that. So the problem is clear. Um, green energy is a really difficult thing to achieve. Um, sustainable biofuel production is hard. Um, we're looking to contribute a little bit more um, to kind of help improve these net energy outputs. Um, we want to lower our input costs and make this a little bit more profitable. Um, we want to utilize some of these untapped resources in terms of um, marginal lands and a little bit less um, commonly thought of type crop in terms of tall fescue. Um, use these resources to contribute and uh, improve the situation. So how I actually um, go about doing this data or doing this experiment, um, this was actually something that was started before I became involved. Um, in 2008, the, plant, the, the plants actually went into the field. Um, we got our materials and did all of this in 2008, and in 2009, for the off season of 2009 was um, winter, I guess. Uh, this all happened at the Laramie Extension Center here in Laramie, um, over on 30th and Harney. And we have 252 tall fescue lines that we're working with. Um, these lines are replicated three times in each field, and we have both an irrigated and dry land field. Um, these lines were developed at the Noble Foundation in Oklahoma, um, and they <coughs> were derived from a drought-tolerant parent and a drought-susceptible parent. Um, a cross between those two individuals resulted in some progeny lines. Um, I think there was, this is maybe an F3 line, I believe, that we're dealing with, and um, so that's where our lines came from. Um, when we planted them out, we planted them in one meter grid. Uh, in a grid fashion, um, so no plant is closer to any other plant than exactly one meter. Um, and when these plants were planted, they were very, very small. Um, there were only three tillers present. Um, I'm going to show you a picture in just a moment that kind of shows where they were, and then I'm also going to show you a picture of where they've come since now, since then. Um, the first season, just because we were working with such small plants, um, both the dry land and the irrigated fields were watered um, just to allow for adequate establishment before we really started putting the screws to them in terms of drought treatments. <coughs> so this is a picture of a grass um, that's just a little bit under the three tiller stage. You can kind of see that there's one tiller there and another tiller there and kind of some leafy stuff going on. Um, but that's about all there was when we put these plants in the field uh, in that 2008. Um, this is the field map that's kind of showing um, that we're using a completely randomized block design um, to plant these out. We have our replicates um, arranged east to west, or west to east, I'm sorry, um, just normal map orientation. Um, and again, the three replications. Uh, the plants are plotted, or plots have plants directly in the center of each of these squares, um, again, just kind of making that grid pattern. Uh, this is a picture that shows that just a little bit more clearly. Um, and again, notice how much bigger these have gotten in just a few years. Um, much, much <coughs> growth has occurred since 2008. So <coughs> that 2009 growing season, we actually established our uh, treatments. Um, we started doing our drought stuff, and then we also started harvesting and collecting data. Um, some of the traits that we measure are plant height and leaf width, flower number, flowering date, tiller count, plot girth. Um, the last two measurements are kind of a measure of just how much um, more grass is present uh, than there was initially, how much 
lateral growth has occurred. Um, and then we also use a canopy temperature depression measurement. Um, this is kind of a, we use an infrared thermometer to determine the difference between the temperature of the plant and the temperature of the ambient air. Um, as plants have their stomates open and are performing photosynthesis, they're losing water and this cools the plant. So this canopy temperature depression measurement is kind of a window into some water use um, dynamics and also some photosynthesis information. Um, and we look at that a little bit more uh, later on. Um, so before we actually harvest anything or conduct, conduct our measurements, um, we try to get a nice uniform uh, growing condition established early in the season. Um, when, we, when we allow uh, three growing or three harvests, um, it means that you kind of have a, a short window to work. Um, you've got just a week or two before um, we get out and harvest to collect data. We want this to be as short a time period as possible um, just for uniform measurements. And so it gets a little bit hectic. Um, yeah, so once we actually go out and harvest our plants, um, we take a lot of inside measurements. Um, we take all of our samples inside, we take fresh weights, we take dry weights, we calculate water content, and then <coughs> after we're done kind of with the, the raw samples, we have to analyze them with, um, for quality. Uh, we have a lot of samples that we're analyzing for quality. Um, we have 252 lines that replicated three times for each plot. There's three harvests for each plot, and then there's a field, uh, uh, a dry land and an irrigated section. That adds up to a lot of samples that need ground and analyzed. Um, this is a big job, but somebody's got to do it. Um, once we get our samples ground, we are um, using a near infrared spectroscopy technique um, to determine what's actually in this plant material. Um, we're looking at neutral um, detergent fiber, acid detergent fiber, um, crude protein, um, and this is all going to tell us kind of what's, uh, what these individual lines are applicable for. Um, things like fiber and sugar content are going to be really desirable for a biofuel type of application, but are going to be a lot less desirable for forage. Um, crude protein is something, if we see a lot of that, this is going to be a good line for um, cows and other forage animals. So once we get all the data collected, we have to crunch it into something that actually makes sense. We have to analyze the stuff um, and draw the connections, find out what's important and what's influencing what. Um, again, the completely randomized block design is going to influence the type of analysis that we can use. Um, we're intending to use the statistical analysis software version 9.2 to actually do the calculations and uh, we're going to use an analysis of variance, again, to find the correlations, to get everything linked together, um, and just make it all into one big complete picture. Um, so some of the really preliminary data that I've got right now um, is, it, it's, it's got a lot, long ways to go. Um, but I do want to show you some of the variation that we're working with. Um, two of the really important traits that we were uh, hoping to see a good correlation with are the dry weight um, and the water percentage. How much water is in these plants we were hoping to um, would directly influence how well they grow. Um, we were hoping to kind of use this to learn more about the water use efficiency or the water use kind of patterns. Um, as you can see there's a little bit less correlation than we had hoped. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not usable data, it just means that these two parameters aren't as closely related as we'd hoped. Um, another thing to notice is we have some really significantly larger individuals, um, individual lines relative to the others. Um, there's a lot of variation. There's some really small plants and there's some significantly larger plants. Um, this is going to be really useful when we're going to actually do a statistical analysis. 
um, this variation is hopefully going to be um, linked to some of our other traits, other than the water percentage. Um, that pre this previous, this, this slide is for our dry land plot, a um, little bit more fluctuation in water percent. And then for our irrigated section, um, there's a lot less variation um, in terms of the water percent. There's a lot wider variation in terms of the actual dry weight. Um, again, we're looking for high producers, but there's a lot more to the picture, um, and we're hoping to determine more about it in the future as we're continuing to do our analysis. Um, just kind of summarizing those figures uh, in a little bit more of a table sort of um, presentation. Uh, we have our dry weight, which was, again, probably the most important, um, the most con significant um, factor that we're looking at in these, out of these, uh, in this preliminary data set. Um, we can see our very lowest couple of lines and compared to the very highest lines um, in each of the dry land and irrigated sections. Um, again, we didn't quite see the correlation between the water percentage that we had hoped, um, but again, there's also some good variation here. This gives us hope that in our future analysis, we'll be able to link some more of these things together. Um, so again, I'm talking about the future, where we're actually intending to go with this. Um, we're gonna continue to analyze our data, we're gonna do the statistical analysis, and then from there, we're hoping that this will yield us some information that will be useful um, in a more commer commercially applicable setting. Um, a genetic analysis will be able to link um, some of these traits that we've measured to some of the genetic regions. Um, this is going to allow us, well maybe not us, but the researchers conducting this future experiment um, will be able to select for varieties that are most highly adapted to these environments. Um, again, the most likely place that this will be uh, applicable is in a commercial setting. Um, there's gonna be some really serious breeding programs that are required before we ever have anything um, ready for a consumer. But that is the grand goal. We want this to be a, uh, usable to growers. We want to benefit um, our producers. So our new cultivars will potentially be able to do that. Most highly specialized, most um, highly selected for traits, uh, the most valuable traits can all come together to create a very competitive variety. And again, this is all with the intention to benefit those at home, um, the people who are funding the research, the taxpayers, the producers. Um, that's who, who we're looking to help. So kind of just to wrap it up, um, remember that tall fescue is, it's a great grass species. It's really performed well in forage applications. Um, it has high yields, high quality, but low input costs. Um, it's able to tolerate some of these more harsh environments and we're hoping that this will be applicable um, and useful as a potential feedstock for biofuel. Um, there's a lot of use um, around tall fescue. There's a lot of utilization. There's a lot of applications. Um, a lot of these use um, lower input management techniques. Um, marginal areas unfit for industrial farming are kind of our target area to work with. Um, if we can utilize a similar approach in the biofuel application to that that we already see in the forage production, um, we're really hoping to improve some of that net um, energy output, some of our net profitability, and also um, allow for more food to be produced. We want cheaper fuel, more food, and we want this to just to benefit everybody. Um, so that's kind of what we're working on, um, and I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone, everyone who's contributed um, to the success of this study. Anwar, Dr. Islam, has been really, really critical, um, and also Wendy Cecil and uh, Emmy Kimura were really, really helpful this summer in terms of um, organization, harvesting, really, really helpful. Um, my committee members, uh, Dr. Molloy Saha of the Noble Foundation and Cynthia Weinig um, have also been really helpful. Um, they've contributed a lot to this research. Um, 
and, just, and thanks to the greenhouse staff and also my fellow grad students. You guys really have just helped out immensely. Um, so with that, here are my references. And I would also like to thank you all for coming, um, giving me the opportunity to share this with you. Uh, it's really rewarding for me. Um, it makes me feel like this is kind of the, the ultimate goal, is passing this information on to everyone else. So thank you all for giving me the opportunity. And I hope to see you in my future seminars. <laughs> So this is a huge project. It was a lot bigger than I had initially suspected. So <laughs> <laughs> that being the case, what do you see as, you know, because you're talking about future and genetics and yeah. biofuel, this which is obviously going to exceed a master's program. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. I mean, unless you plan on sticking around for 30 years. <laughs> right. So what, what part of this project do you see as your chunk of what? this project that I guess kind of going to be your <laughs> contribution. I'm hoping to link all of this. Um, I'm hoping to get all of this organized around a line type basis. I want to know which lines are producing well. Um, I want to know which lines have exactly which traits um, being expressed well. Um, that's what's going to be most useful to another component, the next component, which is the breeding um, and the actual. Uh, cultivar trials. Um, like I said, I'm working with the lines. I'm probably not going to get to that genetic component um, as quickly as I'd hoped to, but I do believe that um, I'm going to be able to do enough preliminary data to really give somebody the tools to do what they need to do in the future. Thank you. And so you're looking for what are potentially the best parents for future cultivars? Yeah. Um, this, yes, exactly. exactly. cross-pollinated species uh, and perhaps some molecular markers to aid for selection. Correct. Pick the best ones. I don't even know all about that. <laughs> 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 Any more questions for Bryce? <coughs> Our IT help is, oh, Karen. It's just more of a comment than anything from a horticultural perspective. Fescues are just awesome. They are. Right. I, I keep pushing fescue for horticultural purposes. Oh, that's excellent. That makes you feel good. Yeah, they're. Um, I tell you what, they're um, especially in mixes with some other church types. I was I was amazed at how widely distributed it was. When I saw that mm -hmm. picture that had all across Canada, all across the states, even in Hawaii, I was really yeah. really pleased. Oh, yeah. So there's a lot of variation there, and I'm I'm happy to be working with the plant that I'm working with. So, if you were giving this seminar in Arkansas or Missouri, you'd get the uh, endophyte question. I was ready for that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are these things going to kill cattle if uh, they happen to eat them? Um, I believe, and this is something I would have to talk to some of my um, committee members about to verify. But I'm almost, I'm pretty confident that we're working with an endophyte-free variety. Um, so this should be safe for cattle. Um, those endophytes can be a real problem. So we're kind of trying to avoid that before it even gets to that. Matt. Do you ever look at some of the lines? Like, are, are there big differences in the sharpness, I guess, of the blade? Of yeah, the um, that's one of the things that, I, that we're kind of, um, just kind of, we can kind of visually, and you tacti tactilely, I guess, is <laughs> you touch it, right? Um, you can feel the difference, um, and this is, I, I, um, we're suspecting this to be highly correlated to the fiber content. Um, more structural carbon type stuff is going to make for a harder, more rigid leaf, a um, little bit maybe sharper, like you said, um, whereas a lot more protein, a lot more nitrogen in the plant is going to yield a softer leaf. Um, a lot more palatable to uh, a cow. So there is that variation. That's another thing that we're looking at um, looking at in the quality analysis. So that's where that's going to tie in. Come to my next seminar. We'll talk about it then. All right, if no further questions. Actually, thanks to all of you for your patience as we uh, 
rather hastily cobbled this all together. And uh, thanks to Bryce for a good performance under duress, I would say. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Bryce. Thank you.